Let me just uh, figure out how to mute everyone. <clears throat> hmm. That's oh, meeting me. Uh, just give me one second. I'm just trying to figure out how to meet everyone. Hmm. Okay, I see how to do it now. Okay. Okay, so the first thing, um, if you have any questions or anything like that, the first thing um, we're going to talk about, is, uh, well, if you have any questions, unmute yourself, obviously. So first thing we're going to talk about is this new protocol that the uh, region put out. And then we're going to do a little behavioral and uh, well-being of the EMT and stuff. Um, okay. So this is a new, I shouldn't say new, but this is kind of a clarification of when we could terminate, when we can't terminate a cardiac arrest. So the first thing is we have to determine which cardiac arrests we're actually going to consider for resuscitation. So when would we not consider uh, a cardiac arrest for resuscitation? So if there's any um, advanced directive or if there's any signs of obvious death. So let's go through the advanced directives uh, first. So if a patient has a valid out of hospital DNR or a valid MOLST form, which stands for medical orders of life for life sustaining treatment, um, then we do not resuscitate, right? So I mean, if that's filled in, um, signed, you know, and, and present that we could review it, it does, we do not resuscitate. Now, just remember, those documents never expire. They do say on them that they're supposed to be updated every 90 days. And on the most form, there's actually a spot for uh, the person to update it. But, you know, we, we would still honor it, even if it hasn't been updated like it's supposed to, um, you know, every 90 days. So, Really, once a most former DNR is is uh, in effect, it's in effect until the patient rescinds it. So the family can't rescind it, the patient has to rescind it. Um, and then obviously, if the patient's in any shape to rescind it, then they're not in cardiac arrest. So it's not in effect anyway. Um, so that's one thing. A copy is fine. It doesn't have to be the original, but it does have to be signed, completely filled out, and has to be present, right? You have to, you know, actually be able to see it. And there's all gray areas as far as like emails and pictures and stuff like that. So if you have that situation where they don't actually have it, but they're showing you a copy of it on the phone, then call medical control and, and see what they want to do uh, with it. So if there's, if there's either one of those, then we do not start resuscitation. Now, sometimes people that are coming home from the hospital have an in-hospital DNR. So I don't know if Pearl River still goes to the hospital and brings residents back to Pearl River, but if you do, this would pertain in this situation. So that in the hospital, they had a DNR. They don't yet have an out-of-hospital DNR. So in other words, for whatever reason, it wasn't filled out or hospice is going to do it or something like that, but they don't have it. So the in-hospital DNR only covers them for the trip home. Once they physically get into the house, the in-hospital DNR doesn't cover them. So it covers from the ambulance transport from the hospital to the home, okay, or from the hospital to the nursing home, but it doesn't cover, you know, once they get into the facility, then they have to have an out-of-hospital uh, DNR, okay? So that's the way that works. Um, now, what else would constitute not even starting resuscitation? So if they have any obvious signs of death. So when you go to a code, um, one of the first things you should look for is something called dependent lividity. So dependent lividity is that the dependent part of the body. So that's going to change depending on how the patient is lying. But if they're on their back, if they're supine, it would be the small of their back and behind their thighs. Um, the dependent part of their body would get a purplish discolorization. So obviously this is easier to see on a Caucasian than it would be on a uh, um, dark-skinned person. But um, you know you can make it out. It's just a little harder to be able to, to make out. So that purplish discolorization says that the blood has pooled 
okay, um, in the skin because it has not circulated. And that typically takes somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes to occur. So if you see dependent lividity, and you know, obviously it could be three hours later, but if you see dependent lividity, that means the patient is beyond resuscitative efforts. And then the next thing you would look for is um, rigor mortis. So rigor mortis basically uh, occurs when you know the the body's been the person's been deceased for hours. So either one of those two things would tell you that the patient is beyond resuscitative efforts. So really, when you work a code, unless somebody says they witnessed them collapse, you know, if it was an unwitnessed um, code where they said they walked in and found them like that, you should be looking at the part of the body that's closest to the ground and seeing if there's a purplish discolorization. Now, if you look at the top of their body and there's a purple discolorization, that tells you the body died, you know, face down and they rolled that person over. So that would be something that the police would be in interested in. That would be something the medical examiner would be interested in if it was a crime scene. I mean, if they just did it to help the patient and see what's going on, then obviously, you know, it's fine. Um, but uh, that's what, you know, dependent lividity is, okay? So the first thing you would see is uh, dependent lividity. Second thing you would see is rigor mortis. And I'm sure at this point, we know that the, um, the first place that we see rigor mortis is in the jaw. Right, so that's the first place you would you would see rigor mortis develop. So if you come to someone you're checking for rigor mortis, you would try to either open or close their jaw depending on what position you find it in. Now the other things would constitute not trying to even start resuscitation would be if they have any kind of mortal injury. So that's typically trauma, hanging, something like that, where or body decompensation. You know they've been down for days and stuff. So you know if they have a mortal injury, there's you know obviously no sense in in starting. Um, resuscitation. So they were in a car accident, a motorcycle accident, a bicycle accident. You know, they have a, a skull fracture, brain matter showing, their chest is crushed. They bled out onto the sidewalk. You know, in those situations, there's no purpose in starting resuscitation unless, you know, it's going to be, you know, what we have on going on now. You know, if it's like a protest where there's thousands of people and somebody gets run over by a car, you know, you're not going to say, oh, we're not going to work that patient because that, that's going to turn into a riot very quickly. So I wouldn't do anything on the scene. I would pick them up, put them in the ambulance, you know, drive away and I wouldn't work them, you know, if they had a, if they had a mortal injury, but I would just get them, you know, out of public view. So it doesn't look like it's going to inflame the, uh, the situation. So for everything else, this is where this adult cardiac arrest termination resuscitation protocol comes in. So it says after 20 minutes of resuscitative effort. So this is a patient you decided to work and after 20 minutes of working them. Okay. So really where they're getting to is that you know, it's now longer scoop and run on medical cardiac arrests, right? Trauma cardiac arrests, obviously, if they're, you know, workable, it's scoop and run. But on medical cardiac arrests, they would rather us try to resuscitate them in the house for 20 minutes and then make a decision on what to do. So choice one is termination resuscitation. Now where it says, have you considered end tidal CO2? So we all know end tidal CO2 is a measurement of the exhaled amount of carbon dioxide that a patient's putting out. So, you know, in a conscious patient who's having respiratory distress, it gives us an idea of how much trouble, how much trouble breathing they're having by the amount of CO2 they're putting out. In a cardiac arrest, it's a it's a device that clips between the endotracheal tube and the excuse me, and the bag valve mask, and it measures the amount of exhale, exhaled CO2. So obviously to make exhaled CO2, we know that we have to have air to the alveoli and we have to have blood to the pulmonary capillaries that wrap around the alveoli. That's how we generate carbon dioxide. So in a cardiac arrest, we wouldn't really expect much in the way of exhaled CO2, even if we're ventilating them with the bag valve mask, because even with perfectly done CPR, there's not you know, great blood flow to the pulmonary capillaries. So right now, our end tidal CO2, if we measured it, is somewhere between 35 to 45. In a cardiac arrest, we're happy with anything above 10. And the more that number approaches 35 to 45, we know the better the CPR is, the better the blood flow is. So that's why they're saying consider end tidal CO2. And basically the rule is that if you work the code for 20 minutes and you never got the end tidal CO2 above 10, there's no chance that patient's gonna come back. Okay, so um, you know that's just something the paramedics would use. Now, there is going to be, or there, there is already, there is uh, end tidal CO2 for a BLS, which is very expensive. Um, it looks like a pulse oximetry type of thing, but instead of going on the finger, there's a probe that goes between the, um, the mask on the bag valve mask and the bag valve, uh, the actual thing you squeeze, and it would measure the exhaled CO2 that way. Um, and then there's a different port where you have a uh, nasal cannula that has a special nasal cannula that has two tubings on it. One goes to the oxygen tank, one goes to the uh, the measuring device. So you're able to give the patient oxygen at the same point you um, 
monitored or exhaled CO2. And that would obviously be used in a, you know, a patient who's alive, but having respiratory distress. The same thing like we have in the life pack 15, but you know, right now they're still pricey. And I don't know if there's a lot of need for it in Rockland County where, you know, 95, 99% of the calls is paramedics on it. So first and voice said termination, then considering uh, continuing efforts, right? We can choose to try to continue working them. Okay. Or it could be a situation where we're going to just transport because of extenuating circumstances. That's typically a pediatric patient or, you know, somebody who died in public view and it's going to inflame the uh, situation. So, you know, in that situation, we have choices, you know, one, two, and three. Okay. So we're going to go down now a little bit. Okay. Does everyone in the patient care team agree to terminate resusc resuscitative efforts? So if there is, you know, I mean, obviously if the paramedics are there, they're going to call the shots. But, you know, if there's disagreement amongst the two paramedics on whether or not they should resuscitate the patient, then the answer is that you continue efforts. Now, I mean, if there's, if it's a lazy paramedic and there's pushback from BLS, that's correct, you know, then that's the same thing. If everybody can't agree to terminate the, those efforts, then, you know, we should, um, you know, we should continue working that patient and then iron it out later. We don't want to get into a big discussion in front of the family and the house on whether or not we're going to be working the patient. And obviously, this is assuming that the family's kind of on board with everything. Okay. So if the answer was yes over there, does a the patient care team agree to terminate resuscitative efforts, the patient has to meet all this criteria that's over here. So they have to be over 18 years of age. Now, I'll just tell you that this is probably going to um, change a little bit because there's some inconsistencies in what we were previously told. So, you know, we could have a patient under 18 years of age where, you know, we may choose to terminate the resuscitation. Let's say it's a, a drowning and they've been under the water for an hour. You know, it doesn't matter at that point what the temperature of the water is if they've been, you know, under for over an hour. So, you know, in that situation, we, we would probably, you know, choose not to resuscitate. Okay, arrest not witnessed by bystander or EMS. So if it's a witness arrest, technically we cannot terminate it, okay? Um, no bystander administer CPR, so the family, the cops, nobody did CPR. No automatic external defibrillation or manual shocks delivered. No return of spontaneous circulation for that 20 minutes. And at least 20 minutes of proper resuscitation has been provided, right? So if the patient couldn't get, you couldn't get an IV, you couldn't get them intubated or anything like that, you would have to transport and, you know, and let the hospital take a shot at it. Okay. So going down now. So if we were over here where we were going to, you know, work the patient, the answer is yes, we call medical control. Okay. If they tell us to not work the patient, then we call the police or the police probably will be there. But, you know, during COVID, they weren't there that much just because now it's technically a crime scene and the medical examiner's office will have to come. Okay. Again, medical control can order us to continue efforts or medical control can order us to initiate transport. So continue efforts would be continue efforts in the house. You know, maybe they'll say to work it for another, you know, 10 minutes and see what happens or, you know, work it and, and start transporting. Okay. Now, if it was this one over here where the patient didn't meet any of this criteria, so like, let me go back up. So everybody was okay with terminating the family, everybody on the ambulance, you know, paramedics, everybody was okay with terminating. The patient didn't meet any of this criteria. So we're, we're still on track to terminate. The only thing they did here was ALS may terminate without contacting medical control. BLS has to contact medical control. So again, in Rockland, I don't know how much of an issue that is, but you know, in other places where there's not that much ALS coverage, that may be an issue. Okay. And if we do terminate, we just need to make sure the police were notified because it's going to be an ME case, right? So the, the medical examiner is going to have to decide whether they're going to come out to investigate or they're going to release the body to the, uh, the funeral home to come pick up. Okay. So let's just read some of the key points and considerations. When resuscitative efforts will not be initiated or terminated once initiated, either through standing order or online medical control. So again, standing order would be the paramedics. Online medical control would be BLS. Document on your PCR termination resuscitation, indicate the time that resuscitative efforts have been withheld. And then this is important. Note that resuscitative efforts have been withheld and the time of death will, will may not be the same. So we cannot, ALS, BLS, doesn't matter. Only a licensed person, a doctor, nurse practitioner, and I'm not even sure about a PA, but only a, you know, a, a licensed medical professional can 
um, sign a death certificate. So that's why we are not allowed to pronounce death. We are just deciding not to resuscitate, which is, you know, technically the same thing, but we can't say, you know, oh, we pronounced a patient dead at this such and such a time that's going to go on the official legal document because we cannot uh, pronounce a patient dead. Okay, so once transport has been initiated, okay, we have to continue resuscitating the patient. So it's not like you can change your mind. Now, the only thing I would think that would change this, and this is again why I say they have to put some qualifiers on this is, let's say, you know, we start moving them out of the house, we get them in the ambulance, we're getting ready to go, and all of a sudden the family produces the DNR, right? Because up until that point, it wasn't, you know, they couldn't find it. So, you know, again, once they produce the DNR, this now triggers back to the very beginning, which is this patient should have never been worked. So then this document that we're looking at would have never been in effect. So in that case, you know, we could not transport that patient. Now, the problem again is, what are you going to do? You're going to have to bring that patient back in the family's house, put them in bed and cover them and call the medical examiner. So if the family's not on board with that and they want the patient transported, then you would transport the patient. So here's the two issues. You know, you can't go lights and sirens because that patient is not being worked. And is the hospital going to be like, welcome you, uh, welcome you with open arms? So obviously when you, you know, when you pull up in front, hopefully you've called and explained the situation. When you pull up in front, one person should go in and explain the situation to the hospital. And, you know, they may not, uh, they might not be so receptive to taking the deceased person, you know. Um, so I don't know, you'd have to kind of work it out on the fly. You know, we've had situations where we've taken patients out of nursing homes that had DNRs that were alive and then they coded. And the rule is you bring them back to the nursing home, right, if they have a DNR. And sometimes the nursing homes don't want to take them back. And you have to start bluffing that you're going to call the Department of Health and everything like that. So it may have to be the same thing where they may have to get the nursing supervisor involved. And, you know, I mean, you know, obviously understanding from the hospital's point, why do they want to get involved in this? You know, it's, it's not a patient they're going to resuscitate. It's not a patient they're getting paid for. And, um, you know, why do they want to get involved in, in basically, you know, having to warehouse the body and, and do paperwork? So anyway, does anybody have any questions on this document? I sent it out um, to everyone. So if you didn't get it, just shoot me an email. I sent it to Pam, so she should have it up in the building and stuff like that. Um, but that's basically, you know, the new rules that are out there. And I would probably laminate it and put it in your, you know, your PCR box or, you know, what I get most people are uh, electronic, but maybe, you know, just keep it as a, an icon on the screen of the computer that you're doing the, um, you're charting on. Okay, so any questions on this? Okay, so the other thing I wanted to do, you know, under the... Yeah, Frank, I have a question. Sure. Uh, I thought we were allowed to pronounce somebody dead. No, so what happened, you're going back, you know, many years ago to... Well, we uh, still have a, a DOA form on the rig. Right, so it's obsolete. So you're talking about, what was his name? Zugerby, right? Zugerby? Right. So Zugerby, you know basically who, you know, he's dead, um, made this thing. I don't know that it was actually a pronouncement of death, but it was again, an assessment tool. You know, it said, put the, a mirror to the patient's face and, you know, all this kind of silly stuff. Um, and then, you know, if that's the case, then you could decide not to, to work the patient. Um, but, you know, he's dead. The new medical examiner is not going to, you know, obviously honor that. And, you know, by now the state's gotten involved and, you know, the county, the region has gotten involved. So that's, that's all obsolete. Um, it's probably been obsolete for 15 years already, you know, if not 20 years. So that's, that's all, uh, that's all obsolete. But I do, I do remember when we first came here, you know, seeing that being uh, brought out every so often and stuff, but, you know, so it's, it's gone by the way of the, uh, you know, the uh, dodo bird or whatever you call it. Okay. So I thought what we talk about from a psychiatric standpoint, um, you know, because it's kind of relevant to what's going on with the protesters and stuff like that right now, is uh, what they call sudden death in custody, okay? Um, and um, this is basically that a patient who is being restrained, whether it's being restrained by EMS, the police, and maybe a psychiatric situation in the hospital, um, suddenly, you know, has trouble breathing or God forbid even dies and stuff like that. And what we could do to recognize it, prevent it. And, you know, obviously it's happened, right? This is what's going on right now um, that we're facing is that people, you know, in the process of being arrested are dying. And, you know, I don't know what your views on it are, but, you know, in certain situations, it's clearly unnecessary. <laughs> Excuse me. So, okay. 
So, you know, this, this sudden, uh, I forgot, it's the same thing, sudden custody and death or sudden something ICD is the same thing in death. Um, we'll see in a second. But basically, you know, this is a, a newer thing that's been kind of recognized in the last 10 years. We're going to talk about something called excited delirium, which you probably all witnessed in patients, okay, and how that contributes to, um, you know, the patient's death, okay. The patient's physical condition that predisposes to them, how drug and alcohol predisposes to them. The concept of positional asphyxia, which I'll tell you right now, is basically somebody face down is going to have a lot of trouble breathing if somebody's resting on them. And if they're under the influence of drugs and alcohol, they don't even have to have somebody resting on them. Just being face down is going to make it you know, more troublesome. Restraint asphyxia is that when their arms are handcuffed behind their back, it just raises the risk of them stopping breathing. Okay, the, the issues of chemical strains like, you know, pepper spray and, and tear gas and stuff like that, how it plays a role. Um, even, you know, tasers, right, and stuff. So, you know, we had a death in Rockland County not that long ago in Spring Valley. Police tasered someone, the guy died. And when the paramedics showed up, they didn't even tell the paramedics that they tasered the guy. So they just thought it was somebody who died. You know, they didn't even know it was an arrest that the person was being tasered and stuff. Well, they didn't know it was an arrest because the guy was handcuffed, but they didn't know he was tasered. It was only until about uh, really when they were getting ready to transport that somehow or another it came out and, uh, you know, never read anything about it much in the newspaper. It kind of all fed, fell by the wayside. But, um, you know, that was an, another kind of iffy uh, situation. And then we'll talk about medical interventions and stuff like that. So that's the sudden in whoops. Sudden in custody, sudden in custody death syndrome. Okay, so it doesn't have to be police custody. You know, it could be anybody's custody. So it's it's not really like a brand new thing, like I said, but it's definitely something now that in the law enforcement circles is drawing a lot of attention, right? And uh, you know, yes, it's being associated with you know police brutality. Is it 100% every time police brutality? No, but you know, in certain situations, probably yes. Okay, so. We're going to talk about what excited delirium we said is, the physical condition that the patient's in that puts them at risk, alcohol and drug use, the use of physical restraints, chemical restraints, and so on. Okay, So sudden in-custody death syndrome. So there's usually nothing that the police officer can pick up on that's going to say it's going to precipitate it. Okay, And we're going to talk about certain things that may, you know, um, perk in our mind. But, you know, you know right off the bat, if somebody is obese, okay, whether they're laying flat on their back or laying face down, they're going to have a level, tr lot of trouble breathing, right? We know that if somebody's flat on their back, okay, and they're obese, they're going to have what's called Pickwickian syndrome. So what happens is that the weight of their belly presses on their diaphragm and it makes it, you know, hard for them to breathe. Now, if they're excited, okay, you know, because they're being arrested, they're upset and stuff like that, it will just, you know, make it more likely for that, uh, that to happen. And what you're going to see happening now is you're going to see many more times that EMS is going to be summoned to the scene when somebody's under arrest because the cops want to avoid a lawsuit. So, you know, somebody's going to be handcuffed, laying on the ground saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And the police are going to make a policy that they have to immediately call for the ambulance and you're going to get dragged into it. Now, the case out in um, Staten Island, um, I forgot the guy's name, the guy that was singing, selling loose cigarettes out in uh, Staten Island, I guess a couple of years back, it was kind of Rod Rodney King. Garner was the name. What was it? Garner. Wasn't it Rodney King? No, Long Island, no, Garner. No, 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 I'm saying Staten Island, Staten Island. So I think it was Rodney King, but anyway, so. That you know, was, that was Garner. Rodney King was back in the 90s, Frank. You were okay. way behind the okay. time. Okay, what was his name? Eric Gardner, was that his name? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, Rodney King was the LA riots after uh, oh, okay, OJ okay. Simpson. Okay, okay, okay. I stand corrected. Okay, so so Eric Gardner. So basically, you know what what happened in that situation? You know, the guy was arrested for selling loose cigarettes, which again, it you know was not a serious crime, was not a life threatening crime or anything like that. He probably resisted a little bit, and the cops got you know the whole testosterone rush and assumed they had to dominate the situation and held him, you know, face down to the point where he stopped breathing. Now, this guy did have significant medical history that probably, you know, contributed to his, uh, his death. But again, he should not have died for what he did. Okay. Now, when I say dragging EMS into it, if you look at the videos of it, right, Staten Island University Hospital paramedics and BLS. So you had an ALS ambulance, a BLS ambulance showed up 
And these guys stood around, guys and girls, stood around with their hands in their pockets, joking and laughing with the cops and did nothing for this guy, right? And what basically happened was the hospital wrote a check to the family, didn't even try to litigate the case or anything like that. They weren't even sued. They just wrote a check to the family because there was no proper patient care being rendered. So now <clears throat> you've been on all these calls where you know there's a million cops running around, everything's going on. It's not clear what's going on. So you're gonna have to start you know, pr uh, providing or at least documenting what's called defensive medicine. You're gonna have to say, you know, arrived at the scene at 1900 hours, but was not allowed to gain access to the patient until 1930 hours. So you could show that there's a 30 minute lapse of why you could not make contact to that patient, you know, and, and you could say, you know, police did not allow uh, access to the patient for 30 minutes, or, you know, patient was violent and, you know, was, we were not able to safely approach the patient for 30 minutes. So you're gonna have to start, you know, documenting basically why you could not do what you would normally do. Or you're going to have to start documenting how you found a patient. You know, if you pulled up and there's four cops laying on a patient face down, you know, you're going to have to document upon arrival, you know, found this, that. And I know, you know, we don't want to throw people under the bus and stuff like that, but you have to decide who you're going to protect. Because I'll tell you, if it goes the other way, the cops will not, you know, lie for us. We had a situation in Spring Valley where there was a, uh, a black gentleman, an older black gentleman dead on a porch in cardiac arrest outside on a front porch, dead of cardiac arrest and two Spring Valley cops were standing there with their hands in their pockets. And when it became a lawsuit, they got all upset that the paramedics basically said when they arrived that they, the cops weren't doing anything because they wrote, they put the guy on oxygen, they wrote this, they wrote all these different things in their report. None of that was done. Uh, in fact, they then said, you know, oh, there was an extended delay for the paramedics that they kept on asking for help and that they were doing this and doing that. So they already tried to try to twist the story, pushing it back onto, you know, EMS. So you have to realize that when, you know, when there's potential for litigation or people losing their jobs or people being sued, there's no such thing as a friend. So your best time to document is when you're writing the report at the time that this situation happened so that nobody could say you're going back and changing the facts. So, you know, it's going to be a kind of a different, a different world as far as that goes. Okay, so when people have this excited delirium that we're going to talk about in a second, we first have to, you know, um, discuss what is delirium. So everybody knows the term delirious, right? Some of these delirious are not making sense. So delirium is many, many different states, right? It can be people having illusions, seeing things that are not there, hallucinating, right? Um, you know, being very agitated, okay, not being, you know, be able to sit still, restless, being some people even incoherent. A lot of times when people are delirious, they don't feel pain, right? So delirium is a state where they're not mentating properly, okay? So most of the times it's actually has a metabolic origin to it, right? Or a medical origin to it, which is why, you know, you know, all our behavioral emergency cases have to go to a medical hospital first. They can't go directly to a psychiatric hospital. Even when we had Pomona, you know, the, the psych uh, emergency room up in Pomona, they would not take a patient directly uh, because they wanted it to go to a medical hospital and get medically cleared and make sure that the reason why that patient was not acting rationally was not from a medical origin, right? Because they only wanted to deal with the psychiatric aspect of, to it. So, you know, you know, right off the bat, you've seen diabetics, right? Hypoglycemic diabetics that, you know, don't act rationally. You've seen drug overdoses that don't act rationally. So that's, you know, situations when really there's an underlying reason why these patients are not. It's not a, a behavioral, it's not a psychiatric issue. Okay, so substance induced or substance withdrawal, right? So somebody's trying to become clean. Uh, the most common thing, you know, I would say that we kind of see would be, you know, the alcohol, where they have the DTs, delirium tremors, um, maybe coming down from an opioid or something like that, that we, uh, we kind of see people, you know, coming down. Sometimes we trigger it, right? When we give people Narcan, if we give them too much Narcan too quickly, we throw them into withdrawal because we're actually reversing the effects of the opioid. So that's why you see these videos of people getting Narcan and getting up and punching and kicking and, you know, spitting and vomiting and everything like that because we've thrown them into withdrawal by giving too much Narcan too quickly. Okay, so excited delirium is a, a basically a new term that's you know on the market right now. It's where basically somebody gets so excited, so worked up that they go into what's called a hyperdynamic state where their blood pressure starts to get high, their pulse is racing and their temperature starts to climb. And that combination of those three things can kill them from multiple different ways. They could actually have heat stroke, 
okay, without even being in a super hot environment, okay, they can have a stroke stroke, a regular blood vessel stroke, right, from the high blood pressure that's generated if they, you know, have a weakened blood vessel somewhere. They tend to have breathing problems. They can even have heart attacks. And once drugs are on board, you know, all bets are kind of off. So you've kind of probably seen people when they're in this state of excited delirium, you know, um, you know, I remember one time we had a guy who was running and crashing into the wall, basically running straight into the wall, bouncing off, getting back up, running backwards 25 feet and then running back into the wall. And he kept on doing that, doing that until he knocked himself out and everybody just figured it was safer, you know, to let him, you know, get this out of his system and kind of knock himself out than try to go in and, and restrain him because he was so, you know, so out of it. So when they're in this excited delirium, they're very aggressive, they're very paranoid, they see everybody coming at them, they see uniforms, and they're not gonna be cooperative, right? They're not gonna be cooperative. They tend to be numb to pain, right? Where, you know, even though they get tasered or they get maced or they get something or other, you know, they show no effect to it. And you've, you know, heard of these stories. You've heard of these stories, people tasered and they continue to fight, or people maced and they continue to fight. Trust me, if we were tasered or we were maced, we would not be fighting. But when they're in this state of excited delirium, they have that capability. Okay, so again, why is it an issue? Because people that are in this excited delirium are then escalate the situation with the police, right? So this is where you get three, four, five cops now trying to restrain someone, okay, and maybe using, you know, a taser or, or mace or something like that, okay? Now, it doesn't just have to happen with law enforcement, right? We can get involved in that. You know, we got a lot of young guys who think they're cops or think they're eager beavers and everything like that, and they hear restraining a person, and they're very willing to jump in and help and stuff like that. And, you know, when something goes wrong, they're going to get dragged into it just like, you know, everybody else. That's why I always tell people, you know, sometimes we take restrained patients into the hospital and you'll come into the emergency room and they'll tell you, we'll remo remove the restraints. And I'll tell them straight out, we are not allowed to do that. We're allowed to put them on. You need to now get your security down here and your staff down here to take them off. We only put them on. We don't take them off. Because if you take them off and something goes wrong, they're going to be pointing at you, right, when they're, you were just carrying out somebody's request. So my rule is I never take off restraints. If they want them off, they could take them off, you know, at the hospital. And the same thing in the ambulance. You know, you get somebody that was restrained, and now you're going to the hospital, and they calm down. They promise you they're going to be good. And this, just tell them, listen, we're not allowed to take the restraints off because you have no idea if they're just being calm to kind of lull you into a, you know, a false sense of security, and then they're going to go crazy as soon as you take the uh, restraints off. So you just tell them, look, we're sorry. We know we're not allowed to do it. We're going to lose our job if we do it. You know, they have to stay on till, uh, till you get to the hospital. Okay, so what happens physiologically in the body when somebody goes into the state of excited delirium? So there are two sympathetic hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Those are your fight or flight hormones that make you make your heart race, make you work harder. And they're supposed to be released when you're in a stressful emergency situation, which obviously that is what these people are perceiving are uh, released into the bloodstream. So we know already what happens, right? When epinephrine, right? Their heart works harder, faster, they get more strength, they breathe faster, you know, their skin uh, tends to get cold and sweaty. Um, so there's all different things that uh, tend to go on, you know, when this happens. Now, interestingly, the other part of your nervous system that tends to slow things down is also stimulated. So the vagus nervous system is stimulated, which is kind of a, you know, a little confusing because they're usually two opposite. Once your your sympathetic, which is the epinephrine norepinephrine, is stimulated, usually later the vagal is stimulated to slow things down. But in this situation, they're both st stimulated. Okay. So that adrenergic stimulation is what I was talking about, where they go into that hyperdynamic state where they have high blood pressure, fast pulses, fast breathing, and high temperatures, right? So because of that, they have this increased myocardial excitability, which basically means that their heart is going crazy, and some of them do go into cardiac arrest, right? Now, sometimes that cardiac arrest is from a respiratory origin, where because they have pressure of that positional asphyxia, they can't breathe and they get hypoxic. And some of it is actually because they've overexerted their heart to the point where, you know, their underlying cardiac conditions manifest themselves and they have a heart attack. And a lot of times that increased myocardial excitability is more of a risk, obviously, in an overweight person who maybe smokes and is not in great health and stuff like that. Okay, so the physical conditions that put people at risk, over 40, obese, pre-existing medical conditions, specifically cardiac, diabetes, and hypertension, okay, pre-existing mental health conditions, okay, so they already have a behavioral emergency background, and that they're using substance abuse. Now, most of the times, the substance abuse that they're going to be using is stuff that speeds things up, right, amphetamines and cocaine, things to tend to hype them up. 
okay? Now, alcohol does play a role. First of all, alcohol inhibits your inhibition, right? So you tend to get more in trouble with the police when you have alcohol on board because you don't think properly and you tend to do things that you shouldn't do, okay? There's always a chance of somebody trying to come clean from alcohol, okay? And they go into what's called the DTs, the delirium tremors, and they get, you know, very agitated, um, just like anybody in withdrawal, okay? So alcohol also acts as a depressant on the body from the standpoint of if they are being restrained, okay, and now they're drunk, it's going to be a little harder for them to be able to breathe properly, okay? Um, there is a thing with college kids where they, they drink alcohol and Red Bull, which is basically a super caffeinated beverage, and there's other ones out there, um, at the same time. And the reason they do that is that usually, you know, when you're drinking, you start to get mellow and, and kind of, you know, fade out and you stop drinking. But if you're drinking alcohol and a caffeine uh, drink, you tend to stay awake and you're able to drink more, drink more. And when they talk about college medicine or college emergencies, these are the kids that actually die, you know, of, quote, alcohol poisoning. I mean, there's no, quote, you know, term, medical term of alcohol poisoning, but in other words, that they get such dangerous levels of alcohol in their body that their kidney and their liver is kind of shut down. Okay. So alcohol definitely does play a role, right, from the inhibition point standpoint, and then also from the medical standpoint. Cocaine, okay, metaphetamines, all those that are, are um, stimulants definitely, you know, play a role. And some of the interesting things with cocaine we're going to see in, in a second is it kind of masks some of the symptoms that we would, uh, we would think that we would see. So we know that cocaine definitely precipitates agitation, right? People that use cocaine. It, it interferes with thermoregulation, which is the ability to control your temperature. And these are the people that get that, you know, very high temperatures, that heat stroke type of situation without being in a very hot environment. The rhabdomyolysis is the muscle breakdown that we typically see in people who are found lying in the same position for a long period of time. You know, if you're trapped in rubble, uh, you're unconscious and laying in the same position for a long period of time, your muscle starts to break down from the pressure. It's a, basically a, a, um, a problem caused by pressure on muscles. And it, the muscle starts to break down and, least, and releases substances into the bloodstream that makes the patient very, very acidotic. And, you know, we know just from even without talking about you know, this arrest, uh, this arrest scenario that we're talking about, that people who use cocaine sometimes immediately have heart attacks and, and, uh, and just stroke out, right? We've probably all gone on calls where somebody was snorting cocaine, okay, or, you know, speedballing cocaine, and next thing you know, kills over and dies. And you're only going to know what the cause of death was on autopsy. Most of the times, it's they had a stroke or a heart attack. Okay, so when they're using cocaine, okay, the signs and symptoms of pending death sometimes are masked. So they don't get the tachypnea. When, you're, when you see somebody who's been wrestling with the cops, you would expect them to be breathing very, very rapidly. That's what tachypnea means. Okay. So what happens when they, I'm trouble when they have cocaine use, it masks that tachypnea. You don't see that rapid breathing. Also, sometimes their temperature is normal. Okay. And then the last thing is they don't tend to perspire the way you would expect somebody to perspire who was working. Now, remember, if we don't perspire, what happens to our temperature, right? Perspiration, sweating, is our way of cooling our body. So if you're not perspiring, if you're not sweating, okay, your temperature is only going to rise that much quicker. And it's going to put them more at risk for having this, you know, non-environmental heat stroke, right, where they're not out in a hot environment, okay? Now, the term positional asphyxia is basically the term the term coined for somebody who's being restrained face down so that's prone right and they cannot breathe so now in this situation the person's face down with pressure on their back in the situation that we had in in minneapolis that was being done to the person plus there was somebody kneeling on his neck so we're only going to know you know uh, i guess when the autopsy results are completely released if there was compression of this guy's trachea you know, was his vertebrae in his neck broken or was it just straight asphyxia where he just could not breathe? So, you know, if his trachea is intact, his ver cervical vertebrae are intact, then they're going to have to assume that it was just positional asphyxia where he could not, when he's in this position and having all the pressure on his chest, he could not raise his chest to breathe. Now, remember, he's probably in a hyped up situation, which is demanding more oxygen, right? The, the body needs more things when we're in this, you know, this excited delirium state and he could not meet it. Right. So obviously for a short period of time, you know, whatever it was, 
the eight minutes or so they're saying, he was trying to verbalize that. And for some reason, the cops chose to ignore that, right? They, they chose to, you know, ignore the fact that he said, you know, I can't breathe. I feel like I'm dying or whatever it was that he said. Okay. So again, positional asphyxia, okay, usually involves the process of somebody being arrested, but it could also be somebody who's just worn out from fighting, has drugs on board or unconscious and left face down. Okay. So the days of transporting patients face down in the ambulance have stopped, right? It should have stopped five years ago, 10 years ago, but there is no way we could transport a patient face down on the ambulance. Now, if you're worried that they're going to spit, you know, you're worried that they're going to do something, you put a non rebreather on them and they cannot spit. Okay. Um, you know, and then you're giving them, and put it, if you're putting a non rebreather on them, again, from a medical legal standpoint, you better make sure there's oxygen going through it. Okay. Because you're not, you don't want to find out this guy dies. And then somebody else on the ambulance says, well, you know, Frank said not to put the oxygen on. Okay. So again, if you get some idiot that tells you put an oxygen mask on them, but don't turn the oxygen on, you say no. Okay. And it's not enough to say, well, if you want to do that, you do that. Right. You have to say, no, we're not doing that because look what happened to these cops. Right. So the one guy is charged with murder. Three guys are uh, charged with aiding and abetting. One of those three cops that are charged with aiding and abetting was a new guy just pretty much, you know, doing his field training orientation. And he is on tape saying, you know, maybe we should roll them over. Maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do that. And, you know, the other ones were, I guess, no, or didn't let him do it. And he still got charged with aiding and abetting, right? So if somebody tells you to put an oxygen mask on someone without oxygen going and they die, you're, you're as guilty as the person who told you to do it because you, you listened to a stupid thing that you knew you shouldn't be listening to. Okay, the concept of restraint asphyxia, right? So in this case, there's no actual restraint being applied yet, right? Restraint asphyxia means that they're now handcuffed and sometimes even hogtied, okay? And that's just going to... In, you know, inhibit the ability for them to change the size of their diaphragm, right? Change the size of their thorax. If you can't, you know, change the size of your thorax, you cannot breathe, right? So because that bellows effect where, you know, as your chest gets bigger, the pressure inside your chest drops, so air flows in. And when your chest gets smaller, the pressure inside your chest gets greater and you exhale. So if you're now resting on your face down, you can't accomplish that. You don't do it well, okay? So if they, you found somebody like this, the first thing you would have to say is we need to roll him on his side, okay? And if they say no, then say we're leaving. You know, we're, we're not, if you're not going to let us do what we need to do, we're leaving. We're not being part of this, but we saw what happened already, okay? So that's, that's the kind of concept of restraint asphyxia. Now, I've had patients, you know, we're talking everything here with arrests and stuff. I've had obese patients, okay, who fell flat on their back. I had a guy who was sitting on a bed trying to put on um, slippers. So he, he was too big to reach down to the slippers. So he had this like long stick that he was holding the slippers in place and he was trying to put his feet in there to slide them in there. And somehow in that process of doing it, he slipped into a sitting position. So he's by the edge of the bed, he slipped into a sitting position on the floor, okay? And then from his weight resting up against the bed, he pushed the bed to where he started to slide backwards. And then he started panicking, okay? And he started, you know, he pressed his, uh, I've fallen and I can't help, can't uh, get up button. And the long and short, it was two police officers shut up. They tried to get him to move him. They couldn't, he was too big. They then called for EMS, you know, so four people show up, two paramedics, two EMTs. They took straps, they took everything. They're trying to get this guy up, can't move him. They called the fire department. And long and short, he lasted about 30, 40 minutes with everybody trying to get him up, but he died. And he died again from really positional asphyxia, even though he wasn't face down in that case, because he had such morbid ob uh, obesity, it was really the weight of his belly pressing on his diaphragm. So it could happen in a lot of different ways. They tried to intubate this guy, but he had no neck. He was just so fat that, you know, his head was kind of resting on his shoulders and he was like an impossible intubation. I mean, maybe nowadays where we have the cameras to be able to intubate, it might've been a little easier. So they started to try to bag him with the bag valve mask. But again, from the weight, pressing on his lungs, they couldn't get good chest rise. They were pushing more into his stomach than they were into his lungs. So it's, it's definitely possible to see this in other ways. Hold on one second. Okay, so again, that restraint asphyxia, prone, even just handcuffed, hogtied, neck flexed, okay, or even extended, right? Um, the airways, airway could be compromised, okay? Or if they're kneeling on the guy's neck, Okay, like you, you know, kind of see in this picture, that would be 
uh, positional asphyxia. Now, I mean, really what they should do to, to kind of break this habit is anybody who has the possibility of doing this to someone, they should have four people lay on them and let them feel what, it, what it's like to be suffocated. And I guarantee you that that will stop. You know, I mean, that will, that will stop being done. If every time you, once a year, when you go for in-service training, you almost get suffocated, you'll kind of have that in the back of your mind and you probably wouldn't do it to someone. And we, you know, we've all experienced this. I remember as, a, you know, a little kid, we used to play pylon, you know, where everybody jumped on, on each other and stuff like that. You know, if you were the guy at the bottom, you, you definitely, you know, knew what was happening and got pretty scared. And, you know, you had that burst of adrenaline that allowed you to break free because if you had a bunch of people laying on you, you know, you couldn't raise your, your, your chest up enough to breathe. Okay, so chemical strains definitely play a role, whether it's tear gas, you know, um, pepper spray or anything like that. Okay, it can trigger bronchospasm, it could trigger laryngeal spasm, which will make it much harder to breathe, right? Your larynx is the upper part of your airway, your bronchioles are the lower part. So if you have spasming of any part of your airway, you're going to have trouble breathing. Okay. Now, what do we do? So again, this is more geared towards law enforcement. They're telling law enforcement now e EMS early on the scene. Okay. Advise EMS, right, of pre post arrest events and findings. You have to take that with a grain of salt a little bit. Okay. And then again, this is more towards law enforcement, but again, same with us. If you find a situation where somebody's saying they can't breathe, they can't breathe, you have to get them in a sitting position as quickly as you can. Okay. Put them on oxygen, okay, and do whatever you could to render psychological first aid to calm them down. If they're hot, start using cold packs, try to start cooling them down. If the police are not going to remove the restraints because they feel it's dangerous, you know, you're not going to be able to remove the restraints. So you have to do what you, you know, can do for them in the in the restrained position. There's no reason why they need to be restrained hogtied, but you know, they they're probably not going to unhandcuff someone who's been violent and potentially can be violent again. Okay. Um, as far as the pepper spray and, and um, tear gas and stuff like that, I've seen some of the police departments actually have wipes that somehow deactivate it. I don't know what's on them or anything like that, but we don't have those. So you would just have to use, you know, some sterile saline, sterile water, try to flush their eyes and stuff like that as best you can. Okay. And again, the best position is for them to be sitting, whether it be sitting straight up or laterally recumbent, you know, it's, that would be the best position for them to be in. It's, you know, we don't put people having trouble breathing supine for a medical reason. So there's probably no reason to put them supine in, in this position, right, in, in this situation. So I would keep them sitting. Uh, lateral recumbent is kind of how they, the term for how they sit on the stretcher where they're not sitting straight up, okay? And then they have to be monitored constantly, okay? They have to be monitored constantly. Now, remember, some people may be fakers, right? And that's going to be a hard thing to tell the difference, right? You may have somebody who's just trying to you know, play games and, and get sympathy and stuff like that. So that's hard, but I'd rather give sympathy to someone who, you know, may not have deserved it than to, you know, poo-poo someone who dies and then have to testify and explain and worry about my job and worry about, you know, the, the bad press and, and the possible, you know, uh, you know, criminal charges and stuff like that. Okay, so what do we talk about? So we talked about how we're going to recognize the signs of delirium, excited delirium, what symptoms they see and stuff like that, okay? That again, we're going to get involved very early now because this is what the cops are being told to do. Okay, when we're there, don't exact, exacerbate the situation. Don't you know start, you know, bad talking to the person or or you know any way get them more agitated. Just explain to them that you're not the police, you're the paramedics, you're here at the EMTs, you're here to help them. You know what can I do to help you and stuff like that. Okay, if they tell you take the handcuffs off, you just have to explain to them I don't have the keys to the handcuffs, I can't take the handcuffs off you know, the police are in charge of the handcuffs and stuff like that, okay? So when they say contained behavior, rather restrained behavior, that's not always possible, okay? But in other words, sometimes there's ways of de-escalating by talking, okay? Sometimes it may involve, you know, tasering somebody versus uh, physically holding somebody down. And there are risks to tasering somebody, obviously, okay? They're gonna go more towards non-lethal, you know, ways of subduing people moving forward. and there's truly none of those non-lethal ways are truly, um, you know, non-lethal, right? So the bean bags, you know, that shoot out at great force, if they hit somebody in the middle of the chest, we know what happens when somebody's struck in the middle of the chest, right? They can go into V-fib from that comiocortis type of syndrome that happens. So, you know, there's no real, you know, non-lethal, but compared to a bullet, they're obviously less lethal, okay? So again, avoid force unless there's no other way, okay? Okay, try to talk to the person. And we're really not trained in that, right? We're not trained in de-escalation. 
So that's a, that's a big problem. There are some people that are very good at it. Okay, I've seen some paramedics and EMTs that are excellent at de-escalating, um, you know, patients and uh, situations and stuff. But you know, most of us are not trained in it. Therefore, we're probably not very good. Okay, again, force-wise, so you have to, you know, get those people away from the patient that they're all hyped up and they're having that testosterone rush, and they, you know, they're in that state where I have to win the battle. You know, I have to be the strongest guy. Those people are the ones that are going to kill people. Okay. And then properly restraining people means, you know, again, they may be handcuffed, but they need to be handcuffed and sitting, right? Not handcuffed and lying. Okay, so that's basically all I had as far as that goes. So why don't you guys unmute yourself for a second and let's talk about this and if anybody has any questions, any thoughts or anything like that. So any questions, any thoughts or anything about this whole positional asphyxia type of situation? I mean, we know it's uh, it's fairly relevant because there's still riots going on and protests. Okay, so nothing on that. Okay, um, the last thing that we want to talk about, and I'm not an expert in it, is the mental health of the EMT. So we do have, you know, a crisis team in the county. Sorry, I can't help you with notes on Apple. We do have a, a crisis team in the uh, in the county. Okay, both hospitals do have you know, employee assistance programs that you can make available to your employees. Um, we know throughout COVID, there was a lot of situations. What I found very interesting with the the psychiatric or the behavioral problems that we're, we're seeing from EMS providers, it wasn't really about the amount of death. My guys, it was more from when we told them that there were certain skills they could not perform because they were dangerous. So in other words, most of the airway procedures we didn't perform during COVID and we're still technically not performing because we didn't have the right equipment. We needed certain filters to put on our equipment and stuff, and they weren't available, right? They just, we had initial, you know, every medic station had an initial amount and they went through it pretty quickly and you couldn't get any because the government bought them, the hospitals bought them, there were none to be bought. Recently, we got more in, but, you know, for probably about a month, maybe even six week period, we didn't have them. So we were telling the paramedics not to use CPAP, um, to, to avoid intubation, to uh, not use nebulizers and all this stuff. And I had more guys, you know, basically uh, having issues with that. And their argument was, you know, you're telling me not to do what I'm trained to do. You're telling me not to help these people and provide the training that I want. And I was kind of surprised because the reason we were telling them not to do that was to protect them. But, you know, I don't think they saw that. They saw that as that they had patients that were in, you know, respiratory distress and they couldn't help. So I found it interesting, you know, I mean, um, again, once we explained to them that this wasn't something that, you know, we invented, this was something that came down from the state and the feds and, you know, and was proper medicine and that they were not only endangering themselves, but they were endangering everybody in the back of the ambulance, right? The EMTs. And then once they got into the hospital, the whole hospital staff, they kind of understood it. So, you know, I don't know if you had any, you know, um, issues with that, you know, mental health issues as far as EMS goes or anything during the COVID crisis or even in other situations. I know Caroline is, uh, is Higgins is on the, uh, you know, the, the crisis team, you know, in the county. She's not on tonight, but, um, you know, we, we have not used them a lot, but, you know, th that, is a, um, that is a resource. And I do know they have some trained mental health professionals on that team. You know, it's not just made up of EMS people who want to help in those situations. There's actually some trained mental health people. So anybody have anything else they want to add or discuss? Because I don't really have much else, you know, as far as these topics to, to really discuss. So if that's everything, I will send out the link to the quiz and you guys could take the quiz and then, um, you know, get your CME credit. Uh, Frank. Yes. It's Pam. I, I have to go back to, um, I, I wasn't here at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So I want you to touch again on this pronouncement and um, EMT um, capability at a scene of death. So, so I, because I can't imagine you telling me we've been doing something that's been obsolete for 15 years. It's, that's unbelievable to me. So, so again, it's not that you've been doing something wrong. It's that that concept of saying you're pronouncing someone dead is not legal in New York State. That's the only thing. So Zugerby was put on that form that you were pronouncing people dead. In other words, what was the time that you said that person died? And I guess he was using that, you know, and that's what he was writing on a death certificate. That is not a legally okay thing 
The only person who could pronounce death is a licensed physician or nurse practitioner and may also be- So we go on scene. So we go to on scene mm -hmm. and the person is dead. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. So guide me from that point. So you're going to walk in and say, I arrived at 1812, found a patient, you know, pulseless, apneic, not breathing with dependent lividity. Therefore, we decide not to resuscitate. And that's it. And that's it. That's it. Okay. And then, then it will be up to the medical examiner to pinpoint the time of death based on the autopsy. Because on scene, the police will ask you, I know. What is the time of death? So I want to be clear on this now. So you could say to them, we just got guidance saying that we cannot give a time of death because we, we have no way of knowing when that person actually died, right? I mean, you could just explain it like that. We don't right. know if he died five minutes ago or five hours ago, but we're okay. just saying that right now, based on what we're seeing, we're not going to try to resuscitate him. Okay. All okay. right. And if you want, you know, make copies of this, <laughs> you know, just highlight the part that says, you know, we do not pronounce. Okay. All right. Okay. Very good. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so I, just, what's that, John? I'm, yes? I'm just kind of curious. You, you finished off at the end talking about the mental health of EMTs. <clears throat> and as you didn't address it, I wondered, is, is there a plan to, to start doing some basic training for EMTs? I know I, I did uh, training in crisis intervention in Covenant House uh, and worked there for a number of years. And, when I first went on the ambulance and listened with respect to the paramedics, they were just in these soft skills. They were just terrible. You know, well, I mean, the thing, the thing I would suggest is, you know, I would speak to probably the people on that crisis team and see if there's, you know, a need for more people. Um, you know, as far as doing training for EMS, you know, I guess if you put together a presentation, maybe we could do something at one of the hospitals like, you know, Good Sam or something like that and see if we'll get people to attend. Um, you know, and I mean, you could even speak to the, you know, the BERT team here and see if there's anybody who has a background, you know, in, in de-escalating situations, you know, with patients. But um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know from a county level, you know, that would be more like Kim Lippis in the county and stuff like that. Okay. 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 So if that's basically it, then I'll say goodnight to everyone. Have a good rest of the week. Stay safe. And uh, we'll talk, I guess, again in about a month. Take care. Good night, Frank. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night.